It's now my pleasure to introduce Nick Davies. In over 100 articles for The Guardian, Nick cracked open the scandalous hacking affair at Rupert Murdoch's News of the World, which led to Britain's Leveson inquiry into the culture and practices of the press. He was also involved in the publication of secret cables obtained by WikiLeaks and is the author of many award-winning books, including Flat Earth News and Hack Attack. Please join me in welcoming Nick Davies. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, July 2011. Yeah. Rupert Murdoch sits before the Culture, Media and Sports Committee on this, the most humble day of his life. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. Yeah. The world's media holds its breath. Later on, he will be hit in the face with a shaving cream pie. Mm -hmm. Nick, you were sitting there a few rows back. Mm hmm this is the culmination of your five-year investigation. <laughs> How does it feel? Well, so far as the, the guy with the cream is concerned, I was really annoyed by him. I thought he was a complete twerp, an egomaniac. We'd spent years essentially trying to get this very, very powerful man to be accountable. And I mean, the humblest day of my life, that was a PR line that he was fed. But, it, but he was in a kind of humble position. He was being called to account. He was being questioned. And the members of parliament who had always been scared of him were doing a pretty good job. Those select committees are famous for being dull and rather bad at questioning people. But I thought they were doing pretty well. We're giving them six or seven out of ten. And he, he's potentially in trouble. So that was the first thing, that this twerp just interrupted the whole thing, shone the spotlight on him instead of on the issues, and naturally and rightly, I mean, accidentally created sympathy for an 80-year-old man suddenly being assaulted. So that was really irritating. But as to the rest of it, it was, it, was, it was a very exciting moment, actually. That whole, there was a period of about two weeks, which started with our doing this story about the schoolgirl, Millie Dowler, who'd been abducted and murdered, and they'd been inside her voicemail, and which included that appearance by uh, Rupert and James. And it was as if all the rules had suddenly disappeared, and all the power hierarchy had suddenly collapsed. I said before, it was like being in a classroom where the children had suddenly taken over and they were all dancing on the desks and whooping and the teachers were running off down the road. Everything had come unstuck. So that was exciting. But dot, 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 then the teachers come back and they get the cane out and everything kind of returns to normal in the end. So let's go back five years or so. How did you first come to this story? So I could have come to it by being clever in that you know that it begins with a, a trial of the royal editor of the News of the World, Clive Goodman, and a private investigator. And if one had been clever, you could have looked at that trial and said, well, there's something wrong here. Because Clive Goodman, the royal editor, and the private investigator, they were both charged with hacking into the voicemail of three people who worked at Buckingham Palace. But then the investigator alone is charged with getting into the voicemail of five other people who've got nothing to do with the royal household. The royal guy isn't charged with them. So what is this then, these five other people? Why would the investigator be getting in their voicemail? So you could have said, ah, oh, well, I'm pretty clever. I've sussed that out. Obviously, he was working for other people at the News of the World. We haven't got the full picture. Let's go and investigate. But actually, there was nothing clever about this at all. Pe reporters sometimes pretend they're clever. In fact, it's really easy. So I, I was on the radio, and I was talking about a book I had written. Did you mention it? Flat Earth Flat News, Earth. which is about falsehood and distortion in the media, why we tell you so many stories that aren't true. And in writing that book, I'd been talking to reporters from other newspapers about stories behind their stories, what went wrong, and they'd started to tell me about the crimes they were committing, hiring private investigators to do dodgy things. So I'd written a bit of book about crime in newspapers in that book, Flat Earth News, and I was on the radio talking about it, there was a guy there, the managing editor of the News of the World, and he had a real go at me, attacked me, and accused me of coming from another planet. I felt he'd come from another planet, but anyway. And, but he was so rude and so, frankly, dishonest about the reality of crime in Fleet Street that he provoked somebody into contacting me, a man I'd never heard of. And that man became my guide. He simply parachuted into my life and said, listen, here's the truth. Massive, systematic crime at Rupert Murdoch's biggest newspaper, and guess what? The police know all about it, everything, because they started off with that little trial, and that little trial told us there were eight victims. The police already knew from material they had seized in preparing that trial that it wasn't really eight victims. The truth was 5,500 victims. They had all that information in front of them. 
and yet they weren't acting on it. And that's when it starts to become interesting. Why not? Well, it's something to do with the power of this man who used to be Australian. <laughs> and you were initially in that interview talking about the dark arts, and this, this starts with these dark arts, uh, and it, it gets bigger from there, obviously. Mm. But what, what is involved in these dark arts? You mean, what is it that they're doing? What is it that they're well, doing? Well, there's a whole range of stuff. So mostly it involves hiring private investigators because they've got skills, and also because if something goes wrong, the private investigator gets into trouble, but the news organisation doesn't necessarily. So the simplest thing they do is what's called blagging, which is just an English slang word for tricking someone. So they're skilled at contacting an organisation which holds confidential data. So it might be the taxman or a bank uh, or even a hotel where you've been staying. And they will, they will pose as a member of staff from that organisation and trick them, blag them into disclosing confidential data. Usually it's by posing as a member of staff. There was one guy who was known as the Funny Voices Man, a guy called Jonathan Stafford. And he would imitate the famous person. So he would pretend to be Gordon Brown or Jonathan Cleese and maybe call his own accountant and say, I've lost all my tax papers. That's supposed to be Gordon Brown's accent. And, and get them sent to some address where he's temporarily staying. So that's blagging confidential data, which is against the law. And they were using that a lot. Uh, then there's voicemail hacking, pathetically easy to do. They were doing also email hacking, which is more difficult, plenty of that. But they, you know, they send you an email, you open an attachment, bingo, there's software in your computer that relays everything that's in it to them. Maybe the entire contents of the hard disk, maybe just your email traffic. Maybe if, well, as you're typing, they can detect everything you type. It's all quite spooky. They can activate the camera too. It's nasty. Yeah. Then a little bit of live phone call tapping, which is a more serious offence. In kind of brazen smugness of this world, the Sun in the past has actually published stories which were explicitly based on intercepted telephone calls. Nobody said, well, hang on, isn't that against the law? And there's a little bit of burglary went on as well, usually with the private investigators breaking into people's houses to get stuff. So it's thoroughly criminal across quite a, a, bro a broad range. And not unique to Murdoch's <clears throat> papers. No, what, one of the difficulties in trying to get the story out was that other newspapers wouldn't follow it. Now, that's partly because some of them were owned by Rupert, so they have a clear interest in not publishing the story. But there were other newspaper groups who were committing exactly the same kind of crimes. The Mirror Group of newspapers, for example, were bang at it with the voicemail hacking. Mm. And uh, the Daily Mail, a right-wing law and order newspaper, are very heavily involved in bribing police officers. It was just completely contradictory and hypocritical. So they, did, they didn't want to go anywhere near the story because mm. they were involved in similar ways. And why did the dark arts flourish as much as it did on, on Fleet Street? It's a combination of two things. You, you, you'll be familiar with the fact that primarily because of the internet, our business model is broken. We're losing our readers, we're losing our advertisers. And therefore, if there's a way of allowing us to get the information which we need that cuts a corner and keeps costs down, that's very attractive. And then beyond that, it's just that the technology was developed. People have mobile phones. There's this security flaw so that you can quite easily get to their voicemail. Simply, it's possible to do it. So they're going to do it because mm. it makes life easy. So it's a combination of those two things, mm. I would think. Mm. So in regards to the phone hacking story, it, it took five years to play out. And mm. the nature of this story sort of ebbed and flowed. And at first, as you say, it involved the royal family... And some, it was a very innocuous story that, that Goodman and Mulcair dug up from their phone hacking, something about Prince William's knee surgery. Yeah, but the, the, <laughs> Prince William had been out doing something kind of vigorous and princely, manly, and he'd hurt the royal knee. So he called in to one of his staff's voicemail and said, I think I need to see the doctor. Well, so we all now know that Clive, the royal correspondent, was listening to these messages. And Clive understood very well that what he was doing was not just unethical, but also criminal. So when he's writing stories, he makes sure they're not too accurate. He doesn't want to reflect the content of the voicemail. So instead of saying, William has asked to see a doctor, he writes, William last week saw the doctor because he injured his knee. He's just elaborated and obfuscated a bit. Well, as it was, because the knee is not an ordinary knee, it's a royal knee, it recovered without medical intervention. So when William and his officials read this, they go, how on earth would he even know about that? And there's only one, there is only one thing, there was that phone call. Mm. My God, they must be listening to the voicemail messages. It's a giveaway. 
But the thing is, if, if, if Sophie or me or you had gone to the police and said, we think the news of the world is listening to our voicemail, they would have said, well, okay, find a door and use it. We're not interested. But there is a small group of people in Britain who have more power and more prestige than Rupert Murdoch, and they happen to be the royal family. So it's terribly bad luck on Rupert that it was them who complained. So the police pull their fingers out and investigate, or at least investigate to the tiny extent that was necessary. Okay, we will produce in court one royal correspondent, one private investigator, and okay, you can have eight victims. I mean, it's kind of like a constipated police inquiry, deliberately not getting to the truth. Just to explain, what happens is they go and bang on the private investigator, Glenn Malcare's door, and they nick him, because they realise by looking at the phone records that he's helping Goodman to do this. And they seized lots of paperwork from his home and also his computer, and in there is the detail of years of criminal activity targeting mm. these 5,500 people. But they make this decision from the outset. Let's pretend we can't see that. Let's just not go anywhere near it. Did your tipster <clears throat> give you a detailed idea of the nature of the targets in those 5,000 different contacts? Uh, so that original contact uh, was able to give me an overview. So, you know, it's celebrities, it's politicians, mm. sportsmen. And there was maybe a dozen individuals who he was able to not just name, but in ways I probably can't specify, he could actually prove to me mm. that they had been targets. Mm. So when we did the first story, I used those names that I was sure of. So it starts with the royal family, mm. then certain celebrities start to get drawn into the orbit and people start to take notice. But when did public attention really fall behind this story? When did it tip into... Okay. the magnitude that it did. Well, so that, that's only after two years when we do the story about the murdered schoolgirl, Millie Dowler. And it, some people have said, oh, well, that's because the public didn't care about the fact of voicemail hacking when the targets were public figures, you know, wealthy actors, politicians or whatever. But I don't think that was what it was at all. It was that because the other newspapers were failing to report it, by and large, the public didn't know about this scandal. It was only the Dear Little Guardian reporting it, and one or two others joining in at points. But the thing with the Millie Dowler story was that it had such emotional power that just in the ordinary logic of running a newspaper, you couldn't ignore it. So the other newspapers had to start reporting it and therefore told their readers. And what was really striking was that those newspapers had amazing stories tucked up their sleeves. So the Daily Telegraph, a rather conservative newspaper, that certainly wouldn't previously have wanted to expose this scandal, because the former editor, Andy Coulson, who'd been responsible for all this crime, had gone to work for the Conservative leader. So they hadn't touched this story. We do the story about the abducted schoolgirl, Millie Dowler. The next day, the Telegraph revealed, now joining in finally, that the families of people who'd been killed in the terrorist bombings in the London Underground train system in July 2005, those families of those victims had had their voicemail hacked by the News of the World. I mean, that's a shocker. You read that thing, where are your boundaries? And then the next day, they disclosed that the families of British soldiers who'd been killed in Afghanistan and Iraq also had had their voicemail hacked. And so it's the cumulative effect mm. of these stories, bang, 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 and the readers finally being told by these arrogant, secretive newspapers what's going on. That's where you get the public reaction because people finally are being told the truth. And how important is that public reaction? Well, then, it's a, then that's where this strange chemistry started to occur, this very exciting two weeks, because this is, this is really all about fear. We can talk about why in a moment, but people are very frightened of Rupert Murdoch. Powerful people are frightened of Rupert Murdoch. And so people have been tiptoeing around him. One or two MPs had, had been speaking out, but, but the vast majority go, Whoa, we're not going to do it. Suddenly the tide of public opinion changes, and all these selfish mm. politicians can see where the tide is going, and so then they go with it. And suddenly everybody is speaking out. And all these people who'd previously been so quiet are suddenly on the radio saying, well, I never liked the man at all. And they're all suddenly capable of identifying him as an enemy of democracy, which I'm afraid is really what this story is about. You talk about so, fear and you talk <clears throat> about power and the fact that this book is really about power and the mm -hmm. abuse of, of power. And in those early days, it seemed that News International thought all they needed to do was pay people off. They could wield this, the threat mm -hmm. over politicians and that would keep them silent and then they could pay off any celebrities who might, you know, raise yes. issues with this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, one of the enduring images or quotes from, from this story is, is the, the image of Rebecca Brooks sort of blithely, blithely saying that, yes, they had pa paid police for information in the past, mm -hmm. not really even aware of the fact of what of the importance of what she'd said and Andy Coulson trying to clean up after her. At what point did they really start to sweat? They, they the Murdoch company and the police started to sweat a good six months before the Millie Dowler story because it, what the, the frightening thing from their point of view was they knew the truth they were concealing. They knew how bad it could get. So six months before, Millie Dowler was July 2011. In the January before that, Andy Coulson resigned from Downing Street as the Prime Minister's right-hand man. And we think but haven't ever been able to quite prove that he did that under pressure from Rupert Murdoch and Rebecca Brooks. Certainly there was a rumor months before that they wanted him to resign to try to persuade those few Labour MPs who were pushing the issue to lose interest. Because if Cameron lost his right-hand man, that might be the end of the political pressure. Mm -hmm. So Coulson had gone. And you know there was a handful of very brave public figures, people like Sienna Miller, the actress, who were suing Murdoch's company in the UK. And that, that meant not just that conceivably they could get some compensation for the invasion of the privacy, but that the court was ordering the police to disclose that evidence which they had seized from the private investigator and which they were sitting on. That's very threatening to, to Murdoch's crew. So they did a very clever thing. This is, again, months before the Millie Dowler story. They threw in their hand and admitted defeat. So what that meant was that somebody like Sienna Miller would be suing, and they'd say, OK, we admit we did a bad thing. Here's £100,000 compensation. That was the figure they, they... You've won, therefore there's no court hearing. Therefore, the detail of what happened doesn't have to come out. And crucially, the identities of the people who commissioned all this from within the newspaper, that won't come out. It was a very clever manoeuvre because they were, it looked as though they were admitting defeat, but it was a way of uh, continuing the secrecy around the thing. So they were in a lot of trouble. And, and before Millie Dowler, we were getting so much stuff out that there were three new straight and thorough police inquiries being run, which is ultimately what led to the arrest of 210 people. This is massive, the amount of crime they uncovered. I can't remember the question you answered me, but there was an awful lot of sweat going on anyway before <laughs> Millie. <laughs> well, back to that theme of power. How does, <clears throat> how does Rupert Murdoch's power play out in the UK? And, and to the extent that you can comment on this, how do you think it compares to how it plays out here? OK. Well, so there's two ends to that. First, you have to understand the origin of the power, which, as I indicated a moment, it's about fear. And there's two different kinds of fear here. The, the, I think the most significant is a, an individual fear among members of the power elite that Murdoch's newspapers will expose their private lives, specifically their sex lives. So it, it, happens, it has happened from time to time with members of parliament. Suddenly, there they are, splashed across the front page of the newspaper with something really intimate about their sex lives. In the case, you know Max Mosley, who runs Formula One racing, with him, I know he's not a politician, but just as an example of the cruelty of what's involved here, they hid a miniature camera in the bra of a prostitute who he was playing around with and filmed him naked and playing out his sexual fantasy. Apart from the fact that the story itself is illegitimate, I don't think they had any business doing that. If they were going to do the story, they could kind of justify that by saying, well, that's our proof. If he tries to sue us, we can prove it. But they didn't stop there. They took edited highlights of that video and put them on the website, which I think was gratuitously cruel. There's that man's naked body. You imagine your naked body on display for everyone to see, and furthermore, acting out his deeply private fantasy. It's a massively painful thing to do to somebody. My point is this. Just take the members of parliament as part of the power elite. They've all seen it happen to other MPs. And then that power, it's like the power of a school bully. He beats up a couple of kids in the playground. All the other play kids in the playground get the message. We will tiptoe around this guy. We're not going to get into a fight with him. So that's the beginning of the power, and it's a very significant kind of power. And the other kind of fear that he generates is an organisational one, that if his newspapers target your organization, as, for example, at the moment they're targeting the British Labour Party to try to stop a Labour government being elected. They can completely destabilize it so that every day is a crisis. Any little internal debate within the organization is projected as a major dispute. Any problem is a major crisis. Just day after day, they can produce some crazy story which will destabilize you and change your agenda. You spend all your time firefighting. So you have these two different kinds of fear bearing down. 
and therefore lots and lots of, of power. I say the power is really passive. He, so for, as a silly little example of passive power, I, I, he owns something like 180 newspapers around the world. So this little book of mine comes out, and I'm not expecting 180 newspapers to review it. Not one single one has reviewed it, not a single Murdoch title. And it's not because Rupert has called down from on high and say, ignore Nick Davis's little book. It's because all those editors understand the nature of what he wants, and so they take the initiative. And it's like that in the political world, that that power is there constantly as pressure. And you can see it in, in really quite big decision-making by our government. Like, so our elected prime minister, Tony Blair, wanted us to join the European currency. Rupert didn't want him to do that. And for better or worse, never mind the validity of the decision, I would say it was not just an important uh, factor, but probably a decisive factor, that Rupert Murdoch says we mustn't, so we won't. So we elect a government, and this former Australian comes along and tells it what to do. If you look at the decision that we took to join the invasion of Iraq, he's a really, really big player in that decision-making. Mm. And, and the question you want to ask yourself is, how dare he? I mean, who does he think he is? And then you get it in little things. Like, we had this big scandal around a child whose, whose full identity wasn't disclosed. We, he, he was known as Baby P. And he was beaten to death by his parents. And there was an enormous and typically stupid campaign by the son to blame the director of social services in that part of London where Baby P had lived. And I say typically stupid because it completely ignores all the structural defects in the system that's been starved of cash so that the social workers no longer have the resources to do their job properly. It's all blamed on this one woman. And the son were campaigning for the Secretary of State to sack her. He didn't actually have the legal power to sack her because she works for a local authority. But that reached a point where Rebecca Brooks was ringing that Secretary of State. Ed Bulls is his name. And I spoke to officials, you know, they monitor phone calls. I mean, perfectly legally, they sit there and take notes while their minister is on the phone. And she was threatening him. We don't want to have to turn this story on you, Ed. So in the end, he sacked her. He leant down from on high and said, OK, you've lost your job. And she sued and went to court. And the court said this was completely unreasonable and unfair. It was unfair dismissal. But so the power extends, what I'm trying to say, from the great big thing, like whether to invade Iraq, right down to a small thing. What that was about was the Sun wanted to be able to claim victory for its campaign. So all right, the government minister has to jump. But you see, I mean, you, I don't have to tell you, it's really, really wrong that this stuff goes on. Do you think that power has diminished, though? You, you mentioned the campaign against Ed Miliband, and now we're actually looking at a very close result, uh, contrary to what everybody okay. would have picked. A, a, a lot of debate has been had here about Murdoch and his power and the influence mm. of his papers who campaigned... Um, one example is they came, campaigned um, ferociously in Western Sydney against the Labor Party in the last election, and then they didn't actually fare that badly. So okay. do, do you think that power is still as potent? Yeah, you, you asked me to talk about the Australian end, and I'm really not qualified to. But just dealing with that, um, you, you know, the, the, there are experts who study elections, sophologists, mm. they call themselves. And, and they have studied this question of whether or not newspapers really do influence the outcome of elections. It's really hard to detect the extent to which newspaper coverage is changing the way that the readers vote, mm -hmm. and therefore whether or not those readers are actually swinging the outcome of elections. I think it's just something that hasn't been determined. But if you are Ed Miliband or the leader of a political party, you are sufficiently frightened that that might be true to behave as though it is. That's the safe bet. So as a concrete example of this, if you go back to the last election in our country, when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister, he was the target of a nine-month campaign by the Sun, Murdoch's son in the UK, to unseat this elected Prime Minister. They wanted him out. So they, they were not functioning in the way that a newspaper should, but it was a political campaign. Okay. So he asked some of his officials to write him a speech attacking Rupert Murdoch. It was a natural response. Let's, if Rupert's going to target me and get me out of Downing Street... Mm -hmm. I will make Rupert the issue, and the press, and press dishonesty an issue. So the officials wrote the speech, and Gordon never delivered it. The speech is there, I read it, and the, the official showed it to me. Because at the end of the day, that fear that it might get even worse is so inhibiting. So it's like Ed Miliband now, he knows he's under attack. I wrote a piece in The Guardian begging him to, to attack back, but he won't do it, because it's one thing to be attacked, what you don't want is a thermonuclear war. So he, he hasn't raised the issue, he hasn't confronted them. And then whether or not that makes a difference, it's really, really hard to tell. But I would say this much, that 
Murdoch's journalists in London, particularly on The Sun, are putting an enormous amount of energy into trying to stop Ed Miliband being elected. So they at least must think they're having some kind of impact. Mm. There, there are some journalists who work at newspapers here who swear black and blue that Murdoch never, ever issues <coughs> a directive. Yeah. And that he is simply a newspaper man with ink in his veins. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that characterization? I, I think they're quite close to the truth. Mm. I think people outside newspapers imagine that proprietors like Murdoch spend a great deal of time leaning down from on high and telling their journalists what to write. I think he, he makes it very clear to his editors from the outset that there's a kind of ideological area within which he expects them to operate. All of his newspapers are right of center. All of him support that kind mm. of idea of deregulated capitalism, low public spending, low taxes. They're in that framework. That much is clearly handed down. On specific incidents, occasionally, he will intervene. If he has an ally who's in trouble, there was a famous occasion in the UK when Margaret Thatcher was in a great deal of trouble over whether or not to purchase new helicopters from the Americans or the Europeans. It was a very strange scandal, but it got huge and it was threatening. He intervened on that occasion to steer coverage to try to help her out. So in isolated moments, he will do it. Uh, so, for example, when he was trying to placate the Chinese, he stopped BBC World Service being broadcast through his star satellite system there. Those interventions will happen to, to help an ally or to help his business, but they're relatively rare. Mm. And it, it ultimately, he, he's a commercial man rather than a political man. I mean, he's got political opinions, I think, that are so right-wing, they're ludicrous. You know, he doesn't like... He, I mean, he's very bad, for example, on gays and tells <coughs> dreadful yeah. jokes. But that's not going to be reflected in his newspapers because he understands he'll alienate his readers. I think he understands if he gets caught intervening too often, that blows the credibility of his newspapers. So that's bad for business. So, so, my, so I, I, if they say that he never intervenes, mm. I wouldn't accept that. But I think those kind of interventions are rare. Where he intervenes, where the trouble is, isn't with the newspapers, it's with governments. Mm. That's where the big play is. So you say at the end of Hack Attack that really, you know, nothing has changed. The news of the world was, was shut down, but a new paper, you know, appeared in its place. Uh, James Murdoch was jettisoned to New York. Rebecca Brooks will get a job any minute now. Mm. But probably in terms of Rupert Murdoch's interests, he did lose out on the B Sky B bid. I mean, yeah. isn't that the biggest collateral damage to him that came out of that? Well, it was. So you, you understand this, don't you, that, that Murdoch's crew owned 39% of this satellite broadcaster, B Sky B, and it, it was just an amazing fluke that at the same time as our little journey on the phone hacking was coming to a head in July 2011, so too was his attempt to buy all of B Sky B. And this was a huge deal. It was the biggest cash deal on the planet. It's the biggest deal in the whole history of Murdoch's company. And what was beyond, what was envisioned there was an even bigger thing. The idea was if we buy B Sky B, then we have, at that point, its annual cash profit was 855 million pounds a year. If we've got that much cash coming in, we can borrow box loads more cash and then buy either Disney or Time Warner and then we become the biggest media company in the world. That's what it was about. The idea was to do that before he turned 80. And so these two things happened to come to a head in the same week. And that was part of this extraordinary feeling of excitement in London. And all these politicians who suddenly changed sides and discovered they didn't like Rupert, it was, they had actually no legal or constitutional right to say anything at all about the B Sky B bid. That was in the hands of a regulator, which isn't supposed to be subject to political pressure. But the House of Commons did it something that they very, very rarely do, which was that every single member of parliament voted on a resolution calling on the Murdochs to back off B Sky B, who are saying, you've had enough power in this country, now go away, back off. And the message was so strong that he, he dropped the bid, even though they had no legal right to enforce that, that just the level of hostility reached a point where he had to back down. But whether or not that changes very much, you, you may know that last year, he found the cash elsewhere to bid for Time Warner, still trying to be the biggest on the planet. And in fact, that bid didn't succeed. I'm not, I wouldn't say that he won't try again, mm. but at that stage it hasn't succeeded. But the ambition to accumulate more and more money and more and more power appears to be unstoppable. I would say in brackets that a man's ruined his own life. What is the point of reaching the age of 84? And all you do is that. It's not a good life, actually. It isn't good for us either, I should add. 
On a personal level, has he ever contacted you? No, I tried to set up an interview with him. I covered that big trial in London, Rebecca Brooks and Andy Coulson and people. And towards the end, I, I was in touch with some of his kind of lieutenants in New York who were very keen to find out what I was going to write in the book and how much trouble it was going to cause. So I said, listen, you must be spending a lot of time thinking about handling the PR fallout from this thing. And wouldn't it be interesting if Rupert came out on the Guardian website, just a 10-minute video interview with me, because there's no point coming out on his own website, he's speaking to the converted. It would be great fun. And, Good try. You know, he can, Good try. Yeah. And so the message went back. So Rupert, to give him credit, he says, OK, I'll do that. Yeah. So he was up for it. And then the consigliere gather around him, like the kind of people in the Godfather films, and say, hey, Godfather, <laughs> don't do this thing. It won't, it won't help. So he, he was forced to back down. It was a shame. Because I wanted to uh, get close to the old guy because you have to be a little bit careful about this, but you know that in the background he got divorced from his wife, Wendy Deng. After she defended him from that cream pie as well. Yeah. Very ably. But the point is this. <clears throat> he clearly believes, I have no idea whether he's right or wrong, it's none of my business, he clearly believes that she had an affair with Tony Blair. That much has been published. That much, I think, has been leaked on his behalf by a senior journalist of his in London to another newspaper. Two big stories about it with some detail. And a bit more was leaked to Vanity Fair, an email that she had written about Blair. And, and they're divorced. And so it's clear that he's very, very angry with Blair. Now, never mind who Blair takes his trousers off with. I don't care. But, but Blair and Murdoch had a relationship for years which changed the course of history in various ways. And he was, for God, example, Blair on the was invasion. godfather to yeah, one of his Yeah, but the point children. is this. If you can get inside Rupert's office, mm. all right, give him 10 minutes video on the Guardian website so he can talk about how he never knew no crime was being committed, but then say, okay, now talk about Tony Blair politically. Never mind the sexual mm. stuff. You must have hordes of letters and emails and diary dates, and you know what the two of you said when you had that private meal with George Bush. I mean, there's a huge, huge political story there. And I couldn't get into the room with him. But the fact that he was, <laughs> willing, the fact that that he was willing to do that is fascinating because... I don't think he's a coward. And, and he, he, in some ways, it sounds like he's very media managed and, and has a huge mm. PR outfit around him, but then he goes on Twitter and it's very yeah. unreconstructed. Because okay. I, I got to know some of the people who work quite closely with him and what they actually say is he's a nightmare yeah. because he gets out of control and, he, and like, he says things on Twitter that are genuinely stupid yeah. and embarrassing. Yes. And uh, so that go back to that July when he and James had to appear in front of the select committee. I mean, they were tearing their hair out in the background mm. in case the old man lost the script. And, and you remember how he behaved in this way as if he'd suddenly been struck down with dementia. So people would ask him a tricky question. What did you talk about when you were in private with, with Tony Blair? And he'd go, Blair? <laughs> and and I, it was tactical dementia, wasn't it? And, and I mean, he's, he's still perfectly bright and he's got all his marbles. Mm -hmm. But I think they, they gave him that as a fallback. Anything that you might get dangerous about, Rupert, just forget. Wow. Mm. Have you ever looked at his Murdoch here Tumblr? Say it again. He has a Tumblr called Murdoch Here, What's which a is it's like a kind of blog photo journal uh -huh. uh, put together by his chief of staff, and it's just a daily diary of what Rupert's up to. Oh, really? Is it popular? Check it out. I uh, don't know that it's popular, but it's fascinating, uh -huh. and it holds a lot of insight. Oh, no, Not as much as his Twitter account, though. I mean, I think there's. I mean, I, I think what Rupert Murdoch does to democracy is really, really appalling, and that's why it was worth working all this time on and writing that bloody book. But I mean, he's not all bad. I mean, he's, he, he, it's, he's pretty clever, isn't he? In some ways, as a businessman, you've got to give him credit. And, and I, think, I think at least you can say he's earned his money. I think his son, James, <laughs> is, a, is really, really unattractive. I mean, he's just got this sense of entitlement. And, you know, that because it's something... One of the things that the bits of Murdoch ideology is he likes to say, I'm anti-establishment, I'm an outsider... Now, that's not strictly true. He went to Geelong Grammar. I mean, that's not where outsiders go to school, is it? But, but, he's, but it, he did at least build his own empire. Whereas James has this horrible sense of entitlement and is a foul-mouthed bully. And there's something really, really disagreeable about him. If, if you had to be stuck in a small boat on a stormy sea with one of them, you, you, you'd be better off with Rupert. I think he's got a sense of humour as well. I don't know why I've suddenly started defending him. On a broader him. level, because you, you're painting him like felt, a cuddly teddy bear right now. But on a broader level... I just broader felt maybe there's level, nobody in the room who has a kind word to say about him. On a, on a broader level, what is his legacy when it comes to journalism? I mean, one former employee said... 
that hacking on the industrial scale that that took place mm-hmm. in at News of the World could only take place under Rupert Murdoch. He created that unique culture. Is that overstating things, do you think? That is overstating things because we've said these other newspapers mm. were at it. But I do think he's done an enormous amount of damage to the British press. Mm. So when he arrived on the scene, not so much when he buys the News of the World, that had always been a kind of little bit raunchy, but he, he, he buys The Sun, which is then quite a small daily newspaper struggling to survive. And up against it, you had the Daily Mirror, which I think journalists look back on and see as a really fine example of a popular newspaper, that it took complicated issues and tried to explain them, and uh, that it was something to be quite proud of. Mm. Okay, so he takes The Sun and he drives it down market, and he starts in particular publishing photographs of semi-naked women and doing lots and lots of stories about sex. And The Times, which was then not owned by him, wrote a wonderful leader comment after he'd owned The Sun for two or three years where they said, I think the exact wording was, Mr. Rupert Murdoch didn't invent sex, but he does understand its value for circulation. (laughs) And so the effect of of pushing The Sun down market, more and more tat, more and more rumour, more and more silly human stories and more and more naked women, was that the Mirror saw their circulation crumbling and followed. And, And he has dragged the popular newspapers in Britain down market into what you might call the gutter. And there's a sort of second phase that there's marvellous hypocrisy going on at the moment. There's a royal princess born, and one of its first names is Diana. So the tabloid press go, oh, how lovely. There was the grandmother. What a marvellous woman she was. And first of all, just looking at it chronologically, they fastened on Diana when she became engaged to Prince Charles as the biggest human interest story on the planet, this tabloid gift. And because of that, they broke through the walls of privacy and deference, which for better or worse had protected the royal family. And once they made fair game of everything in her private life, right down to who she was sleeping with, then everybody was fair game. It was no longer just criminals and politicians who you were going to go after. Everybody, even Millie Dowler. It's that, it's the breakthrough moment is Diana. And for a while, you know, tabloids think in kind of cliches, so they create this kind of fairy princess story. Then they get fed up with that. And you, if you remember, in the last 12 months of her life, she was the bitch. That, that was the, the caricature of this woman. And they were... It, it isn't just the photographers chasing her down the underground pass in Paris who kill her. For months and months and months, they were... You know, we have this word in Fleet Street, monstering someone, when you target someone and you just relentlessly destroy their character. That's what they were doing to Diana. And I just, I love the kind of, it's more tactical amnesia, really, the hypocrisy of pretending that they always loved Diana and always treated her properly. Now her name's been given to the princess. Ah, isn't that sweet? Mm. But they did their absolute utmost to ruin that woman's life. On a broader level, you, you were saying that this story originally came about when you were doing a publicity tour for Flat Earth News, which was back in 08, 08? Yeah. And you wrote in Flat Earth News about the state, the state of journalism. And you wrote that you, and this is well before the phone hacking scandal, you wrote that you work in a corrupted profession. Mm -hmm. How is it corrupted? So I didn't mean financially corrupted. I I was talking about intellectual corruption. So it comes back to that thing we briefly mentioned, that, that the internet has broken our business model. So you look at the, the age where, in this city, the newspaper, I worked there in the mid 90s. And you just, I arrived in Melbourne two days ago, I pick up the newspaper and you can see, I can see, that newspaper is exhausted, breathless. It doesn't have the staff to do its job properly and it isn't doing its job properly. And so what I was trying to explain in Flat Earth News is that as the business model is broken and resources are sucked out of newsrooms to try and save money, it isn't just, oh, journalists are losing, losing their jobs, who cares? We cease to be able to perform the essential functions of our profession. We cease to be able to go out and find stories. We cease to be able to check the information which we have. What we do instead is we stay chained to our keyboards, recycling secondhand material. Large chunks of it, really large chunks of it, come from the PR industry, which has got stronger as we get weaker. And PR material occasionally is dishonest lies. You remember the WMD in Iraq. This is, this is not the truth. Most PR material is the truth, but it's selected to serve the interests of the political or commercial organization or the celebrity who's paying for it. 
So insofar as newspapers rely on PR material, they are allowing those people who we are supposed to be writing about to choose what we say. That's fatal. And then we can't check. Because reporters who are doing four, five, six stories a shift have no chance of being able to check. So what I, when I said I work in a corrupted profession, what I'm trying to say is we've become structurally likely to put out stories which contain falsehood, distortion, or propaganda. Recycling, unchecked, second-hand material. It's really quite scary. And, and, I mean, we're blind to masses that happens in the world. One of the things we've done is to cut back on foreign coverage, to close foreign bureaus, and to cut off the stringers, the freelancers, who used to be paid by us to cover countries where we didn't have bureaus. So our blindness to the rest of the world is scary. So let's say, you know, a bomb goes off in some foreign city, and we'll buy in a little bit of footage for television which shows, I don't know, a burning car and a shoe with a blood stain on a gutter, and uh, Reuters will send over a couple of hundred words and we'll say, oh, yeah, this bomb went off for the following reason. And then it's off to the next exciting adventure. We literally don't know what we're talking about. We don't know why the bomb went off. Do you see? It's really worrying. And the, these two things, are our structural weakness and the phone hacking, overlap in a sense because the, the journalists at the dark end of Fleet Street, the journalists at the dark end of our profession around the developed world have a bad reputation that reputation smears the reputation of all journalists. All of us suffer from this. And therefore, as our, journal, as our profession goes into decline, the opinion of the vast public out there is, well, who cares? You know, they're liars and scumbags. They're not to be trusted. Good riddance to them. That's a terrible mistake. If it were to come about that over the next 20, 10 or 20 years, because of the failure of our business model, if we die off as a profession, <laughs> this is going to sound like a joke, but you'll be sorry when we're gone. <laughs> you'll say, you know what? We need some people out there who have skills and resources and accountability to go out and try and work out what's true and what's false and then tell us. You, you, it's important, that function. And we are less and less able to do it. And nobody's really worried about it because our reputation is so bad because of the activity of that minority. What about the potential of online journalism? Alan Rusbridger, the Guardian's editor-in-chief, mm -hmm. has been a big champion of what he calls open journalism. Yeah. Um, obviously, the nature <coughs> of the relationship with the audience has changed fundamentally. Mm -hmm. uh, you worked with WikiLeaks, for example. Um, are you excited at all by the potential of this? No, I'm rather worried by it. I think, I mean, the internet's complicated. It's as complicated as the whole human race because it's an electronic equivalent of that. I think there's a lot of naive nonsense talked about citizen journalism and the, the way in which the internet operates. Because what, so if you look at it this way, ever since the Industrial Revolution, it's been possible in any developed society to buy news that suits your prejudice. Choose the newspaper that reflects the, the, the world in the way that you want to see it. Now you can not just consume the news that suits your prejudice, you can generate it. So as journalism goes into decline, what you can see emerging is a kind of information chaos where racists can produce racist news to be consumed by racists. Uh, religious people can do the same for religious people of their particular persuasions. Communists can do the same for communists. People who believe we're all controlled by aliens can do the same. I know somebody who I really like who believes passionately that the world is controlled by a conspiracy of powerful people who are operating for somebody from another planet and the, uh, the object is to try and raise us, raise us to a state of consciousness where we can be moved to the other planet. Now, I've said, how do you know this? Websites. It's all there. So I think there's nothing merry and bright and clever about citizen journalism. Every lunatic with a loud voice gets in there and produces nonsense, and the other people consume it. There's a small minority of untrained, unskilled citizen journalists who are simply brilliant. There's a guy in England called Elliot Higgins who, from his bedroom, has been monitoring... Syrian armaments. And so, for example, when there was that dispute about whether or not Assad had used chemical weapons against his own population, Elliot, sitting in his sitting room, proved it. It's just stunning. He's done amazing work recently on Ukraine, this guy, sitting in his sitting room. You know the uh, Malaysian airplane that was shot down over Ukraine? And there's still a dispute about whether that was Russian, pro-Russian rebels or the government in Kiev. He used satellite photographs to find tire marks in the grass near the border to prove that there was weaponry there. And by, by measuring the distance between the tire marks, he could link it to what Russian weaponry must have been there. And then he found impact holes inside Ukraine and said, well, that's a missile flying at such an angle. If you track back on the angle, it connects up with the tire marks. It was astonishing work. 
So at its best, citizen journalism is great. At its worst, and most of it is very bad, I'd rather read graffiti on a toilet wall. What do well, you think? Well, in that spirit, I'm going to throw to the <laughs> citizens. Not that I do. And we're going to go to some audience questions. Hi, Nick. Um, I'm just wondering, why do you think something on the scale of the Millie Dowler, the phone hacking, hasn't happened in other countries? Mm -hmm. So, America, Australia, so on. Okay. It's to do with train timetables. That in the UK, you have 60 million people crammed into an amazingly small space. And ever since the Industrial Revolution, it's been able to put a, possible to put a newspaper on a train in London or Glasgow, 10 o'clock at night, and by 5 in the morning, you can reach all of them. So we have this incredibly fertile market, 60 million people. You look at Australia, the United States, it just doesn't work that way. You put, on a train on a, put a paper on a train in Melbourne or New York at 10 o'clock in the evening and head it northwards from Melbourne, westwards from New York, by 5 in the morning, it's in the middle of nowhere. So you haven't had that huge national market. You have city papers. The pattern in most cities in the States or here has been one up market paper as the age used to be, one down as perhaps the Herald Sun is now. So the, the level of competition is like one out of 10, whereas in the UK, it's 10 out of 10. Everybody's fighting for that hugely valuable market. There probably isn't another market as valuable as that anywhere in the world. So for the posh papers, it doesn't have such an impact because we're not trying to sell millions of copies. What we do is we target a relatively rich part of the market and make money out of selling advertising. We, it's the advertising in the pages that are the big bucks. But for the mass circulation newspapers who are fighting for the millions, the, the message come down from the, from the commercial side of the paper, sell more copies. And that translates from the editor to the news editor, the reporters, get out there and get the story. I don't care what you have to do, but get me that story. It's, it is a horrible regimes of fear and bullying in those offices. And, and you see the logic is then, if we have to break the rules, if we have to break the law, just do it. It's mm -hmm. utterly ruthless. The back. Hi, I was wondering, what's Andy Coulson doing these days? And are you surprised he wasn't better looked after by the Murdochs, given what he knows? Um, <laughs> such a cynical view. <laughs> <laughs> so, Coulson was convicted of conspiracy to intercept communications, got 18 months in prison, served his time, came out. He's now awaiting a second trial. He's charged with committing perjury during a criminal trial in Scotland when the whole issue of voicemail hacking was brought up uh, in the trial, and he is said to have given uh, dishonest evidence on oath. I think that trial is scheduled for the summer. It's potentially quite serious. You can get three or four years in jail for perjury. As to whether or not the Murdochs have looked after him, when the big trial finished, he was found guilty. There was a gap before he was actually brought back for sentencing, and he was out on bail. And there was a very powerful rumour to the effect that Rupert Murdoch was in London and had secretly met with him and had said, and this would, if this is true, it would be a decent gesture, I'm going to look after your family when you're inside, because Rupert ultimately is responsible. He can say, I didn't know specific crimes were being committed, but he understood in general terms that his reporters got up to dodgy things. So that, that's, that's all I know. I, don't, I'm not, I can't tell you that that's definitely true. I can tell you that there were people quite close to Rupert who believed that, it, that he had met Coulson to give him some kind of financial safety net. I, I said at the end of the book, actually, that I was there when Coulson was sentenced, and he was sitting about three feet away from me, and all throughout the trial, he'd, he'd refused to make eye contact with me. I mean, understandably, I think he hates me. And there was a moment there where I felt sorry for him um, because he had, he'd, he had been very, very powerful. Somebody once said to me that when he worked in Downing Street, he was one of only two people who were allowed to walk into the prime minister's office without knocking. I thought that was a really interesting little measure of his power and authority there. And then he's lost his job, his career, his reputation, his liberty, his home and now he's going to prison. And I, I thought, mm. and then I remembered this particular thing that had happened during that trial, which, which went, they, went back a few years to where he had decided to expose the sex life of a senior Labour Party politician, David Blunkett. I don't know how well-known British politicians are here, but he's blind, David Blunkett. And Blunkett was having an affair with a married woman. And 
I think the fact that he's blind meant, meant that that was quite an achievement. I mean, everything in life is difficult if you're... No, I, I don't want to take the piss out of it. I think it was, it was quite a thing that, that, that he, he was in love with this woman in spite of all that difficulty. But Coulson decided to expose it. So Coulson went to see David Blunkett in his office and said, right, this is what I'm going to write about you. And Blunkett openly, Coulson knew this, had tape recorded the meeting. And that tape was played in court to us during the trial. And what you heard was one human being, David Blunkett, pleading with another, please don't do this to me. You don't have to ruin my relationship with this woman. You don't have to take this away from me. It's got nothing to do with my job, nothing to do with my role as a politician or a home secretary. Please don't do it. And Coulson was utterly robotic and cold. All he can see is the headline. It's that ruthless logic. We can sell more papers if we expose this affair. And so he went ahead and did that. And, if you, and, I, and so when I started to feel sorry for him, I remembered that. And I thought, you bastard, you know, why? And you, you know, if we mentioned this already, the, 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 the fact that I think that he and Rebecca were also, all through mm. this period, themselves having an affair with each other. While they're ruining other people's lives for having affairs, they are themselves cheating on their marriage partners and having an affair. It's just, you know, b beyond excuse, really. It's just cruel. <clears throat> Any more? Yes. Um, could you speculate for us? What do you think will happen when Rupert uh, either dies or his dementia stops being tactical? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not expert on this. So, I mean, it, so it looks as though he's manoeuvring his children back into order of succession. So James Murdoch really took a beating to his reputation. Uh, he, 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 I feel safe in saying that he lied to the select committee that was pursuing this. And do you remember there's a point where he ended up having to say, OK, I was sent an email which showed me that there was crime going on in the news of the world. And I replied to that email, but I didn't read it. I think when you read it, I just, come on, man. So everybody kind of, Christ, we don't believe a word you say. And, you know, he really, really took a battery. And, but I, he seems to have been brought back into favour in New York. Lachlan also seems to have been brought back into the fold. You know that he, there was a point where he got chased out of New York by Murdoch's right-hand men. But he seems to be back. And then, you know, the daughter Elizabeth has just split up with the husband, Matthew Freud. Do you follow all this stuff in, in the UK? And people who know about this, because I don't say that a large part of what was going wrong there, not, not, I think, the core reason, but part of it was that Matthew Freud, Elizabeth's husband, had developed a really, really aggravated and bad relationship with Rupert. And that since he's now out of the way, Elizabeth also can drift back into the centre. So it looks as though he's going to do this very old-fashioned hierarchical thing and let his children inherit the business, even though he claims to be a meritocrat and an outsider. That's what I started to say earlier, and I got lost. Came back to it. That's good. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Nick, um, pre-Murdoch, um, newspaper proprietors in the UK weren't actually angels. <laughs> Beaverbrook, Northcliffe and whatnot. It's yeah. not as if there's always been this wonderful journalistic tradition. Yeah. There's been distortion, and now you've got Richmond, you've got pornographers owning major newspapers mm. like Richard Desmond, and then yeah. there's the, the brothers, tax-dodging brothers that are owning the telly, you know? So yeah. Murdoch is worse, but he's not qualitatively different from a long English tradition. Well, <laughs> actually, I, I mean, he, 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 I, th I think you're right, he's worse. I think he's, he, he is qualitatively different. If you go back to that generation of newspaper owners, people like Beaverbrook or uh, Randolph Hearst in the United States, they were explicitly propagandists. They owned newspapers and overtly interfered in their coverage in order to achieve political ends. And insofar as we might be worried about trying to reform and save our newspapers, it's important to recognise that this generation of owners is functioning in a different way. They're not propagandist interveners in that way. These guys are corporate profit seekers. And so you, you've just got to recognise that there's a different problem and therefore it's got a different solution. But in terms of who's the worst, I mean, I find it hard to pick. And uh, I mean, I think that's, that's one thing that's worth recognising is that if, if Murdoch were to sell his four UK titles tomorrow or all his Australian newspapers, he controls, what, 70% of your daily output of newspapers here, doesn't he? If he sells them, they are very likely to be bought by a Russian oligarch or some Middle Eastern billionaire who would then assume the same instruments of power 
and would ha have the same ability to knock governments around. And so really what we need to focus on is breaking down this kind of monopoly ownership structure. It, it just isn't safe for us as people who want governments to respond to us to allow so much media power to be collected in so few hands. The difficulty is that because we've allowed that to happen here and in the UK, that power itself prevents it being taken away from them because the politicians are too scared of them. So just as a small point, one of the reasons... Well, so, so it is certainly clear that Tony Blair, when he became leader of the Labour Party, before he was elected Prime Minister, set out to recruit Rupert and his newspapers as allies. And you remember he came to... Is it Hayman Island? Mm. Where there was this big yes. conference and he made yes. friends with Rupert. At that stage, before that conference on Hayman Island, his party's policy was to break up media conglomerates, to, to restrict their ownership, to do exactly what we're saying they should do. Murdoch came back from that conference and scrapped that policy. And th there you can see the power working to preserve the power. So no party has done that. I don't know whether anybody here has tried, but they would be mm. asking for a fight. They'd have to be very, very tough. You'd need a huge majority. But that's why I think they should make it an issue. It's so fundamental. So, so they should stand up and say, enough enough of this. We want our countries back. We want our governments back. So let's take them on. And I think people would respond. We, we had something along the lines of an inquiry after the hacking under the Labour government called the Fink Finkelstein Review, but surprisingly it wasn't very well reported in this country. Was that, was that just looking at crime or at political influence as well? It was looking about, it was looking at the influence of the, pa of the papers and, and media ownership as a whole mm -hmm. as well and what, what those implications were for this country given the concentration um, of, of media ownership. Yeah. But, yeah, but I know for example covered. when Gordon Brown was Prime Minister and he realised that Murdoch's press had decided to oust him he saw himself as being part of a, a, a trilogy of targets. That he, he, he was telling his closest advisers, Murdoch wants me out, he wants Barack Obama out, and he wants Kevin Rudd out. He, he saw it as like a global attack by Murdoch's newspapers to push the lefties out of power. And, and I don't know to the extent to which you would say that happened here, but mm. certainly that's the way that Gordon Brown saw it. It's, quite, time. it's, it's a big thing. We've got time for maybe two questions. I wanted to ask you, have you seen the new newspaper, um, that the Saturday paper, put out by um, a man called Sch Schwartz, I think his name is? Oh, no, and I haven't seen this, sorry. Oh, it's, I just wanted to know, it's a bold challenge and whether he'll lose his money. I don't think he will, but... But is he putting out a printed paper or an online yes, paper? Yes, it, it's a once a week paper that comes out and it's quite controversial. So I haven't seen it. And I, all I can tell you is this, that I think anybody who really looks at newspaper finances is expecting that over the next decade, if there's any chance of doing it, newspapers will stop printing and just go electronic because it's so expensive to print it and to get all those trucks and trains to distribute. So if we can lift the amount of money that we earn from the websites, we'll dump that printed paper fast. So anybody who's launching a new newspaper and relying on print is probably walking backwards and is going to get into trouble. But as to the content of it, I just, I don't know. And um, please join me in thanking Nick Davies for the <laughs>